was a day like any other, any other day of slavery. In the fields from day clean to day gone, trying to make it go faster by calling and responding in song. They said, I got wings, you got wings, oh, God sure got wings. When I get to heaven, gonna put on my wings, gonna fly all over God's heaven. Heaven, heaven, everybody talking about it ain't going there. Fly all over God's heaven. While up at the big house, the cook was preparing the meals, turning the biscuit dough over her hands until it had just the right feel. The blacksmith was shoeing the horses as the coachman prepared for the ride. Coachman would be driving Massa that day, a job that he did with pride. Everyone had their position. Everyone had their job to do. Everyone was prepared until the cavalry came marching through. The master, he gathered them together under a tree beside the great hall. It was the 19th day of June, 1865, when the cavalry came to call. Good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle Washington Wilson, and it is indeed my joy and my pleasure to share stories with you this evening in a program dedicated to the celebration of Juneteenth. I'd like to thank the Somerset Public Library especially Lauren Riley and Daryl Voorhees, who's our technical engineer this evening. And I wanna thank them for making this program possible. And I wanna thank you for being a part of the program. Now the general, he read off a paper that said that you are henceforth free and all the future generations were free, yes, even down to me. And many shed tears of joy, but others had trepidations of anxiety because they were not sure just what it meant. What would it mean to be free? I stand today to speak of that day. They came from the fields and the cabins to the big hall. They gathered to learn of freedom that day when the cavalry came to call. So thank you again for gathering here together as I'm going to be sharing some stories and some poems about June 19th, 1865, when the Calvary came to call. Juneteenth is a day set aside to celebrate not just the good news about emancipation, but also a day to remember those who labored so long those whose shoulders we stand upon. Countless people, we don't know their names, but we honor their legacy and the sacrifices they made. So those of us who are familiar with American history know about the Emancipation Proclamation issued on January 1st, 1863 by President Abraham Lincoln. The Emancipation Proclamation declared forever free more than 3.5 million slaves in Confederate areas still in rebellion with the Union. 
It did not free the almost 500,000 slaves in the border states loyal to the Union. States like Maryland, Missouri, Delaware, Kentucky, and some other areas under Union control, including the state of New Jersey. New Jersey still had 16 slaves, 16 people enslaved in 1865. Now, these enslaved, those enslaved in states not in war with the Union were emancipated by the 13th Amendment. And even though Texas was part of the Confederacy, news traveled slow in those days. And it took two and a half years for the news to spread to the Lone Star State. But on June 19th, 1865, the Union General Gordon Granger, upon arriving at Galveston, Texas, at the end of the American Civil War, two years after the original issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation, read General Order Number 3. He said that slavery was over and all men and women and children were free. So what did it mean? What did being free consist of? It was Billy Taylor who said, I wish I knew how it would feel to be free. I wish I could break all the chains holding me. And so this month, we celebrate Juneteenth, Emancipation Day, Freedom Day. We have cookouts and barbecues, and it is not a day of service. It is not a day of sales. It is a day to reflect back and celebrate those who came before us, the survivors those who labored in the cotton fields, the tobacco fields, who unloaded ships on the docks, who shooed horses and built roadways and railways and labored in the swamps, who rocked cradles and cooked for families while their own children went unfed, those who lost their lives enslaved, working till they dropped dead to those who died escaping, trying to free themselves, and those who died in defiance as fugitives on the trail. In this program, I'm going to connect stories and poems, sometimes seamlessly, for the sake of continuity. So I'm going to be using some original songs, um, some traditional stories, and some poems, especially those written by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, the great poet. I'll probably maybe do a Burr Rabbit tale and maybe even an excerpt from the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman by Ernest J. Gaines. So let's get started. Part of the Emancipation Proclamation gave freedom to any persons of color who would join the Union Army and help fight against the Confederacy. The proclamation called for the recruitment and establishment of Black military units among the Union forces, an estimated 180,000 African Americans went on to serve in the army, while another 18,000 served in the Navy. I have a slight interest in genealogy, and I can name eight generations of our Washington family who we know and can document on American soil. This land belongs to you and me. Just last week, I connected with a cousin who's a DNA match on Ancestry.com. We are both direct descendants from a colored soldier named George Washington, who left Virginia as a free man enlisted in the Union Army. 
As I did genealogical research, I found the company muster roll and the U.S. Civil War draft registrations of 1863 of 1865, listing my ancestor, George Washington, right along those who fought and died with valor and pride, protecting the red, white, and you, the colored soldiers. If the muse were mine to tempt it, and my feeble voice were strong, if my tongue were trained to measures, I would sing a stirring song. I would sing a song heroic of those noble sons of Ham of the gallant colored soldiers who fought for Uncle Sam. In the early days, you scorned them, and with many a flip and flout, said these battles are the white man's, and the white man will fight them out. Up the hills you fought and faltered, in the valleys you strove and bled, while your ears still heard the thunder of the foes advancing in the tread. Then distress fell on the nation, and the flag was dropping low. Should the dust pollute your banner? No, the nation shouted, no. So when war in savage triumph spread abroad his funeral pall, then you called the colored soldiers and they answered to your call. And like hounds unleashed and eager for the lifeblood of the prey, sprang they forth and bore them bravely in the thickest of the fray. And wherever the fight was hottest, when the bullets fastest fell, there they pressed unblanched and fearless at the very mouth of hell. Ah, they rallied to the standard to uphold it by their might. None were stronger in the labors. None were braver in the fight. From the blazing breach of Wagner to the plains of Olusti, they were foremost in the fight of the battle of the free. And at pillow, oh, Lord have mercy, or the deeds committed there and the souls of those poor victims sent to thee without a prayer. Let the fullness of thy pity or the hot wrought spirit sway of the gallant colored soldiers who fell fighting on that day. Yes, the Blacks enjoyed their freedom, and they won it dearly too, for the lifeblood of their thousands did the Southern fields bedew. In the darkness of their bondage, in the depths of slavery's night, their muskets flashed the dawn, and they fought their way to light. They were comrades then and brothers. And they more or less today, they were good to stop a bullet and to front the fearful fray. They were citizens and soldiers when the rebellion raised its head. And the traits that made them worthy of those virtues are not dead. They have shared your nightly vigils. They have shared your daily toil. And their bloods with yours commingling has enriched 
the southern soil. They have slept and marched and suffered neath the same dark skies as you and have met as fierce a foeman and have been as brave and true. And their deeds shall find a record in the registry of fame for their blood has cleansed completely every blot of slavery shame. So all honor and all glory to those noble sons of hell, the gallant colored soldiers who fought for Uncle Sam. They was talking in the cabin, and they was talking in the hall. But I listened kind of careless, not a thinking about it all. And on Sunday, too, I noticed they was whispering mighty much, standing all around the roadside when they let us out of church. But I didn't think about it till the middle of the week. And my lies, he come to see me. And somehow, he couldn't speak. And then I seed all in a minute what he'd come to see me for. They had enlisted colored soldiers. And my lies was going to walk. Oh, I hugged him and I kissed him and I begged him not to go. But he told me that his conscience, he was calling him so. And he couldn't bear to linger when he had a chance to fight for the freedom they had given him and, uh, and the glory of the right. So he kissed me and he left me. And I promised to be true. And they put a knapsack on him and a coat, all colored blue. So I give him Pap's old Bible from the bottom of the drawer when they enlisted colored soldiers and my lies went to war. But I thought of all the weary miles that he would have to tramp and I couldn't be contented when they took him to the camp. Why my heart now broke with grieving till I seed him on the street. And then I felt like I could go and sew my body at his feet for his buttons was a shining and his face was shining too. And he looked so strong and mighty in that coat of soldier blue. That I hollered, step up, Manny. Though my throat was sore and raw when they listed colored soldiers and my liars went off the wall. Oh, miss, she cried when Massa left her and young miss mourned her brother Ned. And I didn't know these feelings and the very words they said. But when I told them that I was sorry, they had done giving up data. But they only seemed more prouder that they men had heed the call. Both my masters were in gray suits. And I loved the Yankee blue. But I thought that I could sorrow for the losing of them too, but I couldn't, for I didn't know the half of what I saw till they listed colored soldiers and my liars went to war. Now, Master Jack, he come home all sickly. They said he was broke for life. 
they said, and left my poor young master somewhere on the roadside dead. When the woman cried and mourned him, I could feel it through and through, for I had a loved one fighting in the war of danger, too. Then they told me, told me they had laid him somewhere, somewhere way down south to rest with that flag that he had fought for shining there across his breast. Well, I cried. But then I reckon that's what God had called him for when they enlisted colored soldiers and my liars <laughs> went to war. A large part of the Juneteenth celebrations were like a Memorial Day for colored infantry. And then there was the chance to celebrate, to have great outdoor gatherings with food galore, to dress up in your Sunday's best and forget about your chores. There was always storytelling. Call it tall tales or swapping lies. There was always a tale about Burr Rabbit, a critter, a little critter, who could outwit big critters 10 times his size. The stories were not really about the animals. They were just personifications and allegories. How the black man would outwit his opponents, that was the moral of the story. In this trickster tale. Now, you know, you know, Burr Rabbit had a lot of children. I mean, sometimes he had as many as 14 little rabs hopping around his yard. And he was always telling little rabbits, now, when you go outside play, keep your eyes open for danger. Keep your ears alert for the voice of a stranger and keep your feet ready to move. When you see trouble, meow, go the other way. You see, the little rabbits could get into danger right quick because everybody wanted a taste of a fat little rabbit. Mm. Well, one day, one day, Burr Rabbit had to go out uh, shopping. And he told his children, go outside and play and don't leave the yard unless since you have to. And remember, keep your eyes open for danger. Keep your ears alert for the voice of a stranger and keep your feet ready to move. When you see trouble, go the other way. So Burr Rabbit's little children rabbits were outside and they were having the best old time. They were rolling and tumbling and hopping and skipping and staying in the yard. When down the road, here come Bro Wilbur Wolf talking to Burr Freddy, Freddy Fox. They was talking as they was walking. Well, now you see here, Brother Fox, and Brother Fox, he was saying, yeah, yeah, I know, uh-huh, uh-huh, I know. When all at once, Brother Wolf spotted Brother Rabbit's churn, and Brother Wolf said, ooh, look at them little rabs over there. Mm. Well, I can just taste them right now, swimming in gravy or in a bowl of carrot stew. You know, rabbits and carrots go good together. I'll bet they be mighty sweet. Bert Wolf said, shut your mouth. I bet they be sweet and fat and everything. Let's go get them, said, said Bert, Bert, Bert Wolf. Let's go get them. But, but now, wait a minute said Burr Fox. Now, let me tell you, 
See, them no rabs, they belongs to Br'er Rabbit. And old Br'er Rabbit, you know, he's slick as butter and mighty quiet, too. It won't take much for him to sneak up on you. He might come back down the road whilst we getting them. Hmm. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll go over there. And I'll catch them little rags while you watches out for Burr Rabbit and you keep him talking while I get the little rags. And then when I get them, you come on down the road and meet up with me and we'll split them up. I'll keep some and I'll take some and we'll eat them all. What? Said Burr Fox. What? That's something about that don't sound right. You gonna take some, you gonna keep some, and well, I tell you what, you get, we gonna get all them little bunnies and put them in a basket and take them home for dinner. Well, they got to fighting over who was gonna get some and who was gonna keep some and who was gonna take some and who wasn't gonna get none. They got to fighting over and over who was gonna watch and who was gonna wait. And then it got into a fight and there was teeth and fur and dirt flying every which way when the little rabbits saw what was happening. They heard the plans for what was going to be going on. And they took off running just as fast as they could in the opposite direction of trouble. They ran right smack into Burr Rabbit. Daddy, daddy, Burr Rabbit said, children, children, uh, where's y'all running to? Burr Rabbit leaned over and this big old jug slid off his arm. And the little rabbits looked at that and they forgot that the, what, why they was running. So now you know them little rabbits were mighty curious. What's in that jug, Daddy? What's in there? Well, now perhaps I'll let you see, said Burr Rabbit. And he took the cork out and he said, here, taste that cork. Well, each one of the little rabbits just got him one little lick off that cork. Mm. Oh, daddy, they said. Oh, daddy, that is good. What is it, daddy? What is it? Well, bro, rabbit, he said, uh, this is what we calls molasses. Molasses. Oh, daddy, 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 that was good. Give us molasses, daddy. Give us molasses. Well. Burr Rabbit, he said, uh, okay, we'll get some more, but this is not the proper way to eat it. Now, see, we're going to go home and we're going to let your mama make us some of them big old cathead biscuits. And then we're going to put us some sweet butter on the plate. And then we're going to add that molasses over the plate. And then we going to break open them big old cat head biscuits. Mm. And then we going to slap it down in these molasses and sweet butter. And then we going to sop up that sweet butter and molasses. And we sops and we eats and we sops and we eats and we sops. And, and that's when the little rabbits, when they heard that word eat, the little rabbits remembered why they was running. Oh, daddy, daddy, Burr Wolf and Burr Fox said they's going to skin us and take us swimming in a pot of gravy. Yeah, daddy, or in a bowl of carrot soup. Daddy, I think they want to eat us. So, daddy, remembered what you said. Keep your eyes open for danger. Keep your ears alert for the voice of a stranger and feet ready to move. When you see trouble, go the other way. Well, Bro Rabbit said, oh, uh-huh. Rabbits and gravy and carrot soup. Well, we going to see who's going to skin who and who going to eat who. Burr Rabbit put that jug on his shoulder and he went on down the road. Sure enough, 
Br'er Fox and Br'er Wolf were still fighting. The fur was still flying. And Br'er Rabbit said, um, howdy, fellas. Well, they stopped. And and Burr Wolf said, uh, 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 "How you doing there, Burr Rabbit? <laughs> how you doing? Mighty fine day." And Burr Fox said, "Yeah, yeah. How you doing there, Burr Rabbit?" Well, said Burr Fox, "I'd like to stop here and talk to you fellas, but I've got to go." And he winked at Burr Wolf. And Br'er Wolf winked back. Br'er Fox, he went on down the road, figuring he was he was going to find out where those little rabbits was at. So, so, so there, Br'er Rabbit. <laughs> How you doing? Br'er Rabbit sucked his teeth. Yeah, well, what was you two doing here? Oh, oh we was just, uh, <laughs> we was just speculating. Just a speculate. Well, said Br'er Rabbit, I'm going to go on and let you keep on uh, speculating because I got to go home. And just about that time, that jug slid down off his shoulder. Well, Br'er Wolf was mighty curious. And he said, oh, uh, 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 Br'er Rabbit, uh, can I see what you got in that jug? Br'er Rabbit. He said, perhaps, perhaps I can do better than that. Taste this. And he gave Burr Wolf the cork. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's good. Oh, that's mighty good, said Burr Wolf. What is it? Now, listen said Br'er Rabbit. Don't let nobody here tell of this. It is the sweat off of a fox's nose. What you say? That's it. It's fox sweat. Fox sweat. Fox sweat. Yes, sir. Mm. Well, said Burr Wolf, it is mighty delicious. How you get it? How do you get it? Well, now, said Burr Rabbit, first, you got to close up all your fingers nice and tight like this. And then you raise back and you let that balled up hand connect right with the tip of that fox's nose, hard as you can. Uh, now, is, is, is that the only way, said Burr Wolf? Are you, are, are you sure? Oh, I knows what I knows, said Burr Rabbit. And I can't tell you nothing else, but I will tell you this. The fresher that sweat is, the better it's gonna taste. <gasps> I got you, bro. I got you," said Burr Wolf. Now, 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 now. How do I get it? Uh, how, how can I get some of that around here? It's fox sweat," said Burr Rabbit. How do you think? Burr Wolf said, "You means I got to." Yep said Burr Rabbit. Yep. And I can't tell you. Everybody got to figure it out on their own just how to get it. Oh, oh, I got you. I got you. I got you, said Burr Wolf. Yeah, well, you know what, Burr Rabbit? I'd like to, to stay here speculating with you, Burr Rabbit, but uh, I, I, I got to go get me some of that fox sweat. And Br'er Rabbit said, all righty then. And Br'er Wolf took off down the road faster than a freight train. He was running. And Br'er Rabbit just stood there and listened. Hmm. 
Well, after a long time, Brer Rabbit heard Brer Fox hollering, hey, hey, what's your doing? With that, you know, with your hands all balled up. What are you trying to do? Don't you, don't you touch your hands with that stick down. Hey, you better unroll your fingers and get your keys back up in your head. Okay, you better unroll your fingers and get your keys back up in your head. Don't you? <laughs> Burr rabbit just left. <laughs> I fooled them again. My children listened to me when I told them, keep your eyes open for danger. Keep your ears alert for the voice of a stranger and keep your feet ready to move. When you see trouble, go the other way. Because see, the trap that they were setting for somebody else ended up being the trap they set for themselves. Brer Rabbit, he twitched his nose and wriggled his tail and went on down the bunny trail. And that was the end of that. Boop, boop. Now, as the sunset got low and the fireflies thickened, somebody always had their own version of the eagle who thought he was a chicken. You see, there was this farmer. And one day while the farmer was out on a hillside, that led up to a mountain with a cliff, the farmer came upon a nest, a nest of eagle eggs. Well, the mother eagle was out swooping around looking for food and the farmer, he thought, mm, I will take these eggs and I will put them underneath my setting hens. Cause those hens, they will nest on anything. And when they crack open, I'll have me some eagles that I can put on a show and people will pay me money to come and see these eagles. And so the farmer took the eggs and he put them up underneath his setting hens. And the setting hens, they did what chickens do. They sat on the eggs. Well, the hens had several eggs in their nest. And one day the eggs began to crack open and each little baby chick beep, 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 crack that egg and open their little eyes to their mama chicken and then those great big eggs began to crack sheep sheep peep peep and this big old brown bird came out the egg. Well, they were the mother chicken's little chicks. She had hatched these eggs. And so she loved them just the same. And she lined all her little chicks up and she decided she needed to give them names. And so when the two big ones, the last two to hatch came out of the egg, she decided to name um, the first one, shy chicken, because he seemed a little reluctant. And then the other one reminded her of Captain Fry. So she named him Fry Chicken. Let's be careful what we name our children for it might become their destiny. And so as time went on, Shy Chicken said, oh, look at me, look at me. 
I am a beautiful little chicken. And they went around the barnyard, him and all of his little chicken siblings. And they went to chicken school and they learned how to do chicken scratch. And they learned how to eat worms and roll themselves around in the dirt. But, you know, Shy Chicken, he never was really too into this, but he did it anyway because that's what all the other chickens were doing. So he continued with the chicken scratch and the eating worms, but uh, it just seemed like those worms weren't doing it for him anymore. And he started watching those mice running around in the barn. Now that, for some reason, seemed to interest him. Well, one day, As he was on his way over to the barn just to, you know, check out those mice and what they might be doing for dinner, he came across a pond, a pond of water. And there were ducks there. And so, you know, he figured, oh, let me go over here with the ducks and, you know, let me just take a little sip of water. And as Shy Chicken leaned forward to take Mm, just a little sip of water, he saw something he had never seen before. A big brown chicken. And then it seemed to mirror his very movements. He would flap his wings and it would flap its wings. And pretty soon, he realized that this must be his reflection. Well, he rushed home to tell his brother, Fry, Fry Chicken, guess what? I I, I saw a a reflection, an image of myself in the pond, and, and guess what? I'm brown. And 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 fried chicken said, uh, "Okay, and you're happy about that." And and shy chicken said, "Yes, and, and I got to tell you something, brother. You're brown too." Fried chicken said, "No, no, that's not possible. I am white. I am a chicken. I do what all chickens do. I dig in the dirt." I make chicken scratch, I eat worms, I wait until the farmer's wife brings us a handful of corn, and even though she throw it on the ground, I am not too proud to get down there and eat that corn because I am a chicken. Well, Shy said you might be a chicken but you are brown when you are not white like the other chickens. So pretty soon, Shy just decided to just leave Fry alone, just let him go on with his chicken scratch and worm eating. And then he looked up in the sky and he saw a great majestic bird such as he had never seen before with a huge wingspan much bigger than the turkeys, much bigger than the geese. And this great bird swooped down into the barnyard and said to Shy, what are you doing here among these chickens? Who, me? Said Shy? Mm-hmm. I, well, I'm a, I'm a, you know, pop, 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 pop. I'm a chicken. Well, the great bird said, no, no, no. You are not a chicken. You are an eagle. I said, no, no, no. I think you got it wrong. See, I'm I'm a chicken. And and that's my brother, Fried Chicken, over there. He, he's a chicken. And those are my little sisters and brothers. Aren't they cute? And they're, they're, we're all chickens. So the eagle said, listen, 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 you are an eagle. I am an eagle and you are an eagle and you can fly. Fly, said Chai Chicken. I, 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 I can 
cats walk and, and I can get away from the cat. And No, 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 said the great bird. You are an eagle and you can fly. You can fly high. You can soar over the mountaintops. Come on, jump up here. Just give your wings a, a, a flap. Well, Shy Chicken, you know, these wings had been weighing him down, and every time he tried to walk like the other chickens, it seemed like these wings were dragging the ground. So he said, okay, they must be good for us. And he gave them a flap, and he rose up onto the branch of the tree. Now try it again, said the great eagle. And so Shy Chicken flapped his wings, and sure enough, he flew. He went up in the sky, and he called back down to his brother, cry, cry, chicken, look, look at me, I can fly, I'm an eagle, and you're an eagle too, oh no, oh no, uh-uh, uh-uh, said fried chicken, I'm not, I'm a chicken. And I'm going to stay down here, and I'm going to eat these worms, and I'm going to get this food that the farmer's wife throw out here on the ground, and I am content being a perfectly good chicken. And so the great eagle said, then we must go. Because everybody that came with you is not going with you. And so they took off and they flew. And as they flew, they were having such a good time. And shy chicken forgot about being shy. And he forgot about being a chicken until he looked up and he saw a great mountain. And he said, oh, no, we're going to die. I need to turn back. We're going to crash right into that mountain. And the great eagle said, oh, no, oh, no. That is the mountain of indifference. He said, don't worry about that. Just keep focusing. Just keep the faith and you will be able to fly over that mountain. And then when they looked up again, the little eaglet, he saw a great valley and he said, oh, we're going to perish. We're going to fall into the valley. And the great eagle said, oh, no, that, that is the valley of despair. Don't despair. Continue to fly. And so they flew and they came across a great lake. And the little eaglet said, oh, surely we're going to fall and we're going to drown. And the great eagle said, oh, no. That is a lake filled with discrimination. But if you continue to fly, you will soar and you will fly above any type of discrimination. And so the two eagles, they flapped their wings and they flew and they flew to a place where the chilly wind don't blow. Now, as the sun goes down, marking day gone, the pound cake's been eaten, the red punch is drunk too, the baskets are packed up and ready to go, the celebration is almost through. The Freedom Day celebration begins to draw to a close and the old folks begin to tell their own stories. And this is one of those. Now, back in the old days, before the 13th Amendment, when people could not read or write, not on a blackboard, they waited to have a vision to let them know if indeed they would one day see the Lord and go home to be with him. And this 
is one woman's vision. We ain't had no church back then. The people used to hold church in an open field down the road from where the church is now. Well, one evening, me and my friend Grace, we were sitting out on the porch and we was listening to the singing and the praying. Well, Grace, she said, she said, Jane, I believe I'm going to join up with the church. I said, I'm mighty happy for you, Grace. You's a right nice person. Can't nobody say you don't belong up there. She said, Jane, why don't you come and join with me too? Well, it was a lot of people praying for religion back then. And it seemed like everybody was coming through. Everybody was finding their true religion, except in me. I said, Grace, you reckon I just ain't fit for glory? But she ain't answered me. Just say, you go home and you fast and you pray. And one day you too gonna have a vision that you don't come on soon. Well, I fasted. And I prayed, I prayed so much, it seemed like I could barely keep my eyes open out there in the cane field. But then, whew, early one Thursday morning, I was on my way out to the field when it hit me. <laughs> it seemed like a heavy load fell back off my shoulders. And I said, Grace, Grace, I believe I've got it. She said, do you feel light? I said, Lord, child, seem like I can fly. She said, well, that's it. It always makes you feel kind of light. She said, you go on home and you rest yourself because tonight you will have a vision to tell the congregation. And that night I told my story. It seemed like, like I was standing on the edge of an open field. And I had uh, I had a heavy load on, on my back and it was it was weighing me down and, and weighing me down and uh, and, and a, a man appeared before me in a long white robe and his hair was like cockaburras and his feet shone like brass. And he said, Miss Jane, do you wish to be rid of that sack? And I said, yes, sir, it's a heavy load, but, but, but how you come to know me? You must be the Lord. And he ain't answered me. Just told me to be rid of that heavy load and be rid of it always. I would have to carry it across yonder's river and show up where he pointed a river come into view. And I turned around to ask him how he did such things. But he was gone. And so I started on down towards that river with that heavy load on my back. And it seemed like briars and thorns and old sticker bushes started springing up in front of me where they had not been before, but I kept on going. And I stepped my feet down in that old murky water. And snakes, hundreds and hundreds of old oh, water moccasins started swimming towards me where they had not been before, but I kept on going. And the water come on up around my knees. And when I looked up, there 
was my boy Ned. And he said, he said, Mama, give me the sack. And I said, Ned, that's, that's you, Ned. Ned, I, I can't believe that's really you. Yeah. Now, Ned, if that's really you, you tell me what it was that your real mama carried all them years ago. And I could see the face of Satan straining and straining, trying to remember what it was that Ned had carried, but he couldn't remember. And that's how I knew it wasn't my boy Ned. Because he'd have never forgot them two flints, them stones, them rocks his mama give us so we could make fire. And so I kept on going. And when I refused to give Ned that heavy load, he disappeared down below the surface of the water. And my heart was heavy because I had felt joy when I saw my boy dad. But I kept on going with that heavy load. And it seemed like it was heavier than the weight of death. And the water come on up around my heart. And when I looked up again, there was Joe Pittman. And he wasn't old like me. He was still young. As the day that he had died. And he said, Jane, my Cherie. Give me the sack. And I wanted to give it to him, but, but I remembered what that man had said. He said, you got to carry this heavy load for yourself all the way across that river. And when I refused to give it to Joe Pittman, he too disappeared down below the surface of the water. And I kept on going. And the water come up all around my neck. And when I looked up again, there was Mr. Albert Clavio. That old Cajun man. And he was sitting on that horse that had drugged Joe Pittman to death. And he was holding that gun that he used to shoot my boy dead. And he told me, Miss Jane, you better give me that sack. And when I refused to give it to him, he took that gun and he aimed it right at me. And he pulled back on that trick him, but just before he let it go, I set my feet on solid ground. And the Savior was there to meet me. And I wanted to fall down on my knees. But he said, rise up, my child. He said, you've been born again. And I rose. And I felt good and clean and light. And that night, I told my story and I sang my song to the congregation. I said, you got wings. I've got wings. Oh, God sure ain't got wings. When I get to heaven, going to put on my wings. I'm going to fly all over God's heaven.
Thank you for joining us tonight in celebration of Juneteenth when the Calvary came to call. <laughs>